this is Tony. This is Paul coming at you from the Friends for Life podcast. And we're a go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Friends for Life podcast here on YouTube. Thanks for tuning back in. Tonight, we have a special guest. We have Sarah Milliman. She is the CEO of Riverview Industries. You can learn more about them at rviinc.org. Uh, Sarah has a lot to share with her experience in working with the disabilities field for practically her whole life. So there's tons to learn today. So let's dive right into it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Friends for Life podcast. Thanks hey, for tuning hey. back in. Tonight, we have Sarah Milliman. You're the CEO of Riverview Industries. Welcome to the wonderful, mildly updated Friends for Life podcast. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited. I didn't see it before, so it looks oh. just, I think it's, you know, amazing. So. Yeah, it, it's a lot of upgrades, and we still have more stuff that, that's going to get done, but, you know, it looks good, especially Paul side. Like, Paul has really upgraded. Come in on the weekends. I was yeah. going to say, like, I guess I have something behind me, but yeah, like, yours is just... I, I keep staring at that, so I'm just going to be distracted the yeah. whole time. It's okay. fine. Staring at wolves and time. Johnny Cash... <laughs> We have a revolving door of pictures, but it used to just be an orange room. Basically. Actually, it was the white one. It if you want to look at some of our very early ones, like with Chris Doors, like really, it was just, it was bad. <laughs> but enough about all of that. How you been, Sarah? <laughs> I am well. Thank you. That's I'm good. good. Hey, you know, um, just for the viewers, Sarah and I got to work together with some of our um, individuals who have intellectual delays and... She was one of the best people to work with. Oh, thank I mean, you. You you were one of the the greatest. Um, not to put down anybody else that I work with, but you and I, we could definitely talk and be open and do the best that we could for the individual that we served. So. For sure, I think I honestly think about him all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, but yeah, I think what's really really lovely is that I've had the opportunity in that field to work so many different positions. Like I started out direct support professional, you know, like down in the dirt, <laughs> getting stuff done and um, have kind of just moved around in the field and the different aspects. So I definitely have a little understanding of what goes into taking care of someone, supporting them and, you know, just lifting them up and helping them out. So, and that is what is up and very important because I, I don't trust anybody. Um, and some people might take some shade to this. That's why friends for life is a tree because I will give a little shade, but <laughs> I don't believe that you know your job unless you have done a little DSP work. You you have to yes. get your hands dirty. Like that that's just how it is. But first, let's let's go back in time. Like okay. wh wh where did you get your DSP start? So, I got my DSP start in Minnesota in Minneapolis. Mm. So, I turned 18 and decided I was much too amazing for the state of Ohio. <laughs> I got you. And promptly <laughs> moved away. Um, and while I was there, I actually started, I actually went to Bible college. Oh, wow. In Minneapolis, yes. Um, and while I was there, I was in serious need of a job. And a woman who went there was like, oh, my daughter, you know, the place where she works, they're hiring. And they do a sign-on bonus of 250 bucks if you get hired. Oh, and she'll split it with you. And I'm like, $125? I Heck need yeah. that. <laughs> Had no clue what I was getting into. <laughs> I still, I don't think it was until I walked into the house and was like, Oh, this is what I'm doing that I even knew, which is mm -hmm. so funny because as a manager or a supervisor, I would be like, don't you dare enter this field unless you know, you know, like mm -hmm. don't come here willy nilly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I started working in a licensed group home and there were four men who lived there who had developmental disabilities and... I just never stopped. <laughs> there you go. So when did you move back to Ohio? So I lived there for about six years. Okay. And um, just kind of did a little bit of everything. I did, you know, residential in-home care. I did day services. I did job coaching. Um, and then, you know, did ser I served or was a waitress, mm -hmm. uh at night and uh you're just you know, get, getting as much money as you could I in just, any way you could well you know i had i enjoyed my 20s quite a bit there you <laughs> so no comment you know yeah. we need i needed that i hear that <laughs> um but yeah and then so i moved back in oh goodness hold on let me add about 2009 2010 mm -hmm. and um yeah i was like you know what i'm taking a break i'm not doing this field anymore 
And so I moved back, uh, started going to college, uh, and drove by, actually where I'm the CEO right now, I drove by Riverview Industries <laughs> and saw nice. they were hiring, and I, I got back into the field. And so I've been in it pretty much ever since. Beautiful, beautiful. What, it, so did you work the ranks up? there or did you, know, did you apply like to an ad for a CEO were you contacted like um so someone co- actually contacted me so I nice. left so I worked there I worked there as a DSP and then I moved up to a, what the, at the time was called a team lead but it would be now like a house manager gotcha um and I ended up I was pregnant with my first child uh, mm-hmm. my my oldest daughter and Went on maternity leave and then had this opportunity to, you know, further my education, finish up. I had finished up my bachelor's. And I had this amazing opportunity to start on my master's. So I chose to do that and um, left. And so I went and my master's is uh, a master's of liberal and studies, but it's focused specifically in disability studies. So I had just the most amazing. I don't know if everyone needs to hear this, but University of Toledo, we were the first college with a disability studies major offer. Look at that. Go yes. Rockets. Rockets. Be <laughs> rule. I love the staff there. I got the chance to be the graduate assistant. So basically it was just a dream come true because I was working there. I was like just getting that education. And then I got to meet so many amazing like disability rights ad- advocates, activists, yeah. one of those words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or both. <laughs> or both. They were both. Um, and it was great. So as the graduate graduate assistant, they'd be like, oh, hey, we need you to go pick up so-and-so from the airport. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, they cannot escape me. They're stuck in the car. They have to talk to me. I'm going <laughs> to... Total nerd. Um, so I was able to do that. And so after that, I couldn't find a job anywhere. And I ended up getting a job in Columbus at um, a residential provider, and I did that. I did that for about a year, but it was just hard being away from family with with a family of your own. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we ended up moving back to Toledo area where I started working at the board as a service and support specialist. Nice. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just all over the place. And then I got this opportunity for, for a CEO position, and I tried it out yeah. <laughs> still trying it out a year later no, <laughs> no. <laughs> look I'm, I'm what almost four years in and i'm still trying <laughs> hoping for the best we'll try this yeah. it's fine basically um quick question I'm, I'm, I'm i was listening to what you were saying uh was that still around the 09 2010 uh, area that, that you know you were having a hard time finding a job and stuff yeah so it was in 2000 well i graduated no, it was a little later. I graduated in 2013 with okay. with my master's. Um, and then just everywhere I was looking, either the pay was terrible, mm-hmm. <laughs> not <laughs> enough to support my family, and then um, or they wanted a year of post-college experience, which yeah. was very frustrating seeing as I had been at that point in the field for 10... I mean, I'm coming up on 19 years of doing some sort of care in this right. field, you know, or being involved in this field. And so to have that then and just be like, so you're just going to completely disregard all my previous <laughs> history because it's not after college. college right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just curious about that because I think about some of my timelines and the difficulties and advancing and, mm-hmm. you know, finding uh, the, the right fit. Uh, it wasn't always possible, you know. <laughs> it was like I f- this. I feel like this field is so hard to move up in. Yeah. Right, because it's just when people, which is good, like there's a lot of of longevity in it, and especially like in management and supervisors. But it's just, it's a really difficult field to move to move up in, and advancement is not very quick. And mm. then also, it's so interesting like different people's philosophies and that you can feel that in the entire organization because I know that some of the places that I worked at before I couldn't get on board like it just didn't feel like and I know this sounds weird for probably for people who aren't in the field like what you have different philosophies or (laughs) you know but there's just different ways of doing things in this field and everyone has a little bit different way which can be good but when it doesn't really like align with your your morals or your Mm -hmm. beliefs it's it's really hard to like stay yeah Um, I mean it's almost like if if I can like a basketball team you know everybody has a position to play and the coach who is typically the CEO might 
change your position. And you might not feel comfortable as a center playing a point guard. Mm -hmm. And those are just those kind of um, those knucklehead moments, I think, which create those hard to describe hate and love for the field, I guess. I don't right. I don't know. I guess I'm just as confused on how to explain I, it, it as is, you it's are. A re- it's a really hard thing. It's, it's so hard to explain, and I'm, I'm really struggling to articulate. But even, like, the really simple things of being in a provider agency, like, people who don't understand the on-call phone. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that is... You hit the nail I, on the head like, on that Like, I have demoted myself so many times. Like, I completely, like, you got, you got to demote me. I'll take another position. But I cannot answer this phone anymore yeah. <laughs> like people are calling me asking me if we have bread in the house and i am not entertaining that <laughs> on a saturday at 11 p.m yes. <laughs> like why <laughs> yeah. i literally had a step and this was like the break this was the breaking point but i've called on call for stupid reasons so i i can't really yeah. point point fingers but um it was when i, w- I was dating my husband and I'm like, you know, like, okay, I'm trying to nurture this relationship. Here we go. And, you know, we're just hanging out. And I'm like, I'm not, I swear, I'm not answering any more calls tonight. I swear. I get this call. I'm like, okay. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. There's no bread in the house. <laughs> I said, first off, that is not an emergency. <laughs> like, <laughs> calm yourself. Yeah, relax. And I said, well, you know, I actually just went grocery shopping and mm-hmm. it's in the downstairs freezer and I got, oh, there's a downstairs freezer. And wow. I was just like, <laughs> I think like the next day I was like, take no, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take it anymore. I need every break that I, I that I ever missed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I mean, it's it's a, it's such an interesting field because it's so fulfilling, but it's also so demanding. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So just a little bit of everything. <laughs> what what drew you to the field in the first place? I mean, I know you said you kind of went in cold, but what made you stay? Um, I've always, by nature, like enjoyed being helpful or being supportive, right? So I always really thought, I don't know. I, I I look at stories where like people are like just the like the the center of attention and the and the main character. But like I always really like identified with like the people that helped help them get there. Right? Mm, like gotcha. yeah. Like I want to be I want to be that for someone. I want to help people succeed. Um, and not that I don't because I, I we, as we were kind of joking earlier, mm. like I have a lot of ambition, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I've always really identified that. And then I just didn't even realize this field existed when I got into it, which is so weird to say, but it just wasn't ever on my radar. And so I don't know, like just that, that fulfillment that you get from it was really, I was really happy to be doing that. And it definitely felt like, um, I don't, I don't think I really believe in callings, but it definitely felt like it, it really, it felt right. It felt right. And, you know, when I was doing it, I felt like, okay, this is something that I want to see people happy. I want to see people part of their community. I want to see people valued. And then I think for me, actually, like the, the kicker was when I found out the full history of people with disabilities and how much they had been mistreated and how much they've been through. And it's like, I don't know if you can really like work to right a wrong (laughs) in that Mm -hmm. sense. And, and, and those wrongs that were committed will never be righted, but just like, what can we do now to fix this yeah. and how can we make sure it never happens again? So that for me was just, I, I don't know. Like I, I've so many times tried to leave the field <laughs> <laughs> so many times. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. It hurts too much. There's pain yeah. involved. There's too much emotion, you know? And people's like, well, you gotta be professional. You gotta be professional. This is a job. I'm like, no, these are human beings. Mm, yes. Mm. And I, I'm going to love them if I need to love them, you know, (laughs) like that's, what's going to happen. I'm going to give them my all there. You get everything. Um, so yeah, it was, there's times I just try like, okay, I'm done with this. I want something where I don't feel like people's lives depend on my decision. Like that would be amazing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I just always, I always come back to it. And, and now actually I ended up having a daughter with disabilities. And so now it's, it's very personal, right? Like, Mm Yeah. I look at everyone and everything I do and any bit of advocating that I'm doing and that's just for her and making her life better. So, so I'm stuck. So the field yeah. stuck with me basically. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're in it for life now. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you even mentioned that because, um, well, the, the, the part about 
all the pain that that comes with it. Um, I literally just had this conversation with some mutual partners of ours um, on how my wife had to be the person to kind of uplift and keep me in it. Um, it was roughly five, six years ago. I mean, I had a breakdown. I was just so tired. Like you said, the on-call phone, the constant uh, complaining and lack of gratitude mm -hmm. that people even had to have a job in which, I mean, really, it can be very laxed. I mean, it, it really can. And I mean, I broke down. I, I mean, I'm cursing. I'm like, I threw the phone down. I'm like, I'm about to call my uncle. I'm about to start working at GM. You know, I could be get paid twenty some dollars an hour and and leave work at work. And you know, I took my wife to be the shoulder to to cry on. But she eventually, like, like Tony, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. This is you know what you're great at. This is what you love. This is your your passion. And contrary to a little bit to what you think, I do think everybody has a calling. But not everyone answers it. Okay. You know, I think a lot of people get an opportunity and then they don't um, they don't take it because they don't want to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. or they don't want to have to go through it because none of this would exist if I didn't go through that pain. And, you know, from the 40 something individuals we serve to all of the staff that we have. I mean, I provide a lot of opportunities for people and I had to walk through the fire so they can even be able to walk through through their own fire. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you had a calling and you answered it, <laughs> you know? So I'm proud of you and sometimes, I'm happy for you. Sometimes kicking and screaming, but... <laughs> yeah. I don't want to! I don't want to! <laughs> well, I just think it's so weird. Like, it just, like, always came back to this, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and then even... Um, it, with with the birth of my daughter, I was just like, okay, okay, you know, yeah. this is this is what we do now. <laughs> this Heck is yeah. what we do, and so it's it's a it's very interesting. But yeah, I was just talking. Um, I did a presentation recently for um, Opera, the Ohio Provider oh, yes. Associ Resource Association, and I did. I was um, honored. I I got to present, and I talk a lot about being a parent and a professional, and also a provider, right? So I've like had all these different roles. Um. And a lot of it was just talking about all the emotions that you deal with, not just as a staff, because there are a lot. And mm -hmm. I remember like the first house I ever worked at that one of the individuals that lived there died. And that oh, for me yeah. was like my first and, and my so my both my parents are pastors. Right. So I'd been to funerals. I didn't so, know you were oh, a PK. You did, oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I, I was a PK. Oh, OK. <laughs> See, that's who, also yeah. why we're all messed we, up. Yeah. <laughs> Our peers did a number on us. <laughs> That's why we're in a life of ser Sir servitude. <laughs> yeah, service. Uh, no. Um, but yeah, so like I wasn't one of those people that was uncomfortable with death or anything mm. like that. But it it messed with me because it was someone that I like was around 40 hours a week. Yeah. Like I was there. Um, and I felt like I knew. And so like I was kind of talking through some of the things that really shaped me and judgments I had made based on my feelings and my emotions. And that's like, when you think about it, like that's a lot to like yeah. deal with. And the company I worked with in, in Minneapolis was so great. So, because if, if the company is around here, if I operated like they did, I would have no staff. <laughs> they were so, they, I mean, and, and they, you know, were the best of the best, but the owner was a, a psychiatrist, I believe. So you went into oh, interview wow. <laughs> and you took a two hour personality test, like those ones that ask you like the same question five different ways. ways and you're like, yeah. how did I answer it last, last time? time? <laughs> oh, my God. What if they think I'm crazy? What if I am crazy? Uh, am I so, going to get services next? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> we want to support you, but we can't hire hey. you. Um, <laughs> So it, it, we had that. And then you had to meet with him. And he and the whole time he's just like, so. And you're like, oh, he's judging me in his head. He had things like, don't ever come in and talk to me chewing gum because that makes you look stupid. Wow. <laughs> like he I had like all these it. little, all these little things like, don't you ever do this. Don't. And I still to this day, if I'm in a meeting, I will not chew gum like ever. And there's been times where I'm like, oh, God, I just need like a fresher upper here. <laughs> and so, like, so I would always get mints. <laughs> Because <laughs> I just heard his voice in my head. Don't you chew gum? You look stupid. <laughs> okay, um, but it was just yeah, it was just such, and they were so strict on the rules. Like they were just by the book, which I appreciate now. But then I just think like, what a different time that was. And not that yeah. my company isn't or your isn't, but like you know, there's some things that you're like like you're not going to be as strict about. If somebody yeah. came in chewing gum, I, I wouldn't. 
kick them. Well, now I might because I, I like that. I think that that is a cool. Look. If you think about it, though, you're mm-hmm. like, you know. Right. <laughs> I um, I was taught by somebody. I can't remember how it's ingrained in me today. You know, I never leave a seat without pushing it back in. And I judge people on that during interviews if they do it or not. And it's got to the point that I had to stop because <laughs> so many people don't do it. <laughs> so it's like um, I can understand that, but goodness gracious. So another fun <laughs> fact about me is that I also went to a very strict private school, private Christian school that my parents mm. actually started. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, you have. So, uh, <laughs> you have all of the, all of the, all the PK. Yeah. <laughs> What's your therapist's name? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you had to, when you got up, once you got permission, mm-hmm. you don't get up without permission. Once Definitely. you got permission to get up, you pushed your chair back in mm-hmm. and you went. And if you didn't push your chair back in, you actually got a demerit and you could ultimately Whoa. get detention for not pushing your chair in. So I am, um, yes, chair did, goes in. <laughs> so did you um, go to the private school all the way through like middle school, high school? Like how far did you I go? went all the way through uh high school yeah well and at 16 what's that freshman junior wait freshman sophomore junior yeah yeah uh, something like that i went to high yeah, school whatever it was. it's fine <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> i have a Te- great memory te- uh, oh it's the oh, i'm sorry <laughs> It's one of my kids' sight words right now. <laughs> I'm like, do you remember this one? It's the, the. <laughs> remember it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I ended up doing the post-secondary option when I turned 16. And it was really interesting because that was the first time I was exposed to like large groups of people. And it's like in a college setting. So mm. I don't know. My parents never let me go to public school, but they let me go to college. So I don't like, know their rationale <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you would have thought that you started the college afterwards. I remember like driving around with like older people in my classes, like, hey, you want to go get lunch? And like, so like these adult people in my classes <laughs> and hanging out and like thinking now, like, did my parents know that I was like driving in April's right. minivan <laughs> talking about, you know, you know like what? all this. Stop. Like, yeah. No. <laughs> I, I went to the, um, a, a private school up into the sixth grade, and I, I begged my mom. I was like, hey, seventh grade year, three of my friends are going. These are my best friends. Mom, you got to let me go. You got to let me go. And I went, and it was the worst decision I ever <laughs> made. I mean, you never know how awkward things are going to be because I was used to wearing a uniform. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that you had to actually dress to look good. <laughs> and I think it's gotten me a lot of... Um, Issues today. I like why well, I have so many clothes and shoes <laughs> because I really wanted to look nice for the public. I had the opposite. I went to Catholic school until I was uh, graduated from high school and I never wear dress clothes now. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is about as dressy as I get a flannel. And some you know jeans. what? You look good in that flannel. I like that flannel. Thank you. Yeah, it blends just, in with the wall. And I was just about to say match. that. It matches match. the background. <laughs> the best thing about that is like, um, so I was quite the the stout girthy child and uh <laughs> like uniform clothes are never flattering for fat girls like never <laughs> so i just remember always feeling and looking really uncomfortable <laughs> it just it did not work yeah, yeah well i remember that my mom would buy them way too big <laughs> because they would have to last the next year <laughs> right uh so they would always be hemmed up and like she wouldn't do it the right way and like stitch it in she just put him them up in there and then take an iron really hard and press it and just hope that it lasts. But all it took Did she ever use my sorry, but but my mom used like the stuff and I just the, always hit the, the microphone. Little, yeah, the, the stuff that the, you you iron is supposed to stick and then it yeah. never did, so half of it's hanging down. That didn't happen until around the sixth grade. Okay. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, it was just steam. <laughs> steam and heat. Do you think that going to like a private school? Because I know a lot of people that I'm friends with did, they just went to public school. Do you think it prepared you like, to be more, I don't know, st- not studious, but, like, a lot of my friends say that, like, I don't, like, when I go to do something, I can just sit down and do it for, like, hours, whereas they're, like, nope. They, like, it, get, it teaches you, like, a uh, like a Structure. strictness or a structure to your to your uh, life. Like, like what you didn't have an option in school. It's, like, you, you go to the bathroom when you, they say you can go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not, like, oh, whatever, yeah. Do you think it, like, helped you in the long run? I'm just curious, like, personally, because everyone says, like, I had, like, you're you're such an advantage by going to a private school because, you know, you have, like, a better education and better this and better that. So our private school, the one that I went to, was 
was pretty different. So we used this uh, Baptist. Well, we're not Baptist, but or we weren't. We're not. They're not. I'm not. I don't know what I am. Anyways, that just going at a whole just different. A Christian this of is some just sort. like a whole different. You don't have time for that. Do that conversation. You need a part um, two. <laughs> part seven. I still don't know. Oh, no. uh, but um, so it was like this Baptist curriculum, and it was all self-taught. So you sat, you read, you answered, and then you would raise, we had pegs, little pegs you'd put up, and they'd say, yes, sir, I need to go score my work. And you would go and you would score your own work, you would mark down what's wrong, and then you would go correct it, and then go read, like there was a whole process, right? So the self-taught, it did help me in some, in some ways, but mostly I realized when I actually started going to college that I learned terribly that way, that I was actually really like math. I always thought I was terrible at math. I flunked. I ended up cheating my way through high school, if we're being completely honest. Like I cheated on my final math exam. There you go. I cheated so much, and I, I was such a good cheater through. that I would fail <laughs> I occasionally. Didn't even it. <laughs> I would fail occasionally, just so they wouldn't catch on too much that I was cheating. Like, <laughs> that, I really, look, that's intelligent in and of itself. I mean, I'm just saying I had it down to to a, to an a art, yeah, science, <laughs> an art form. Um, so. Parts of it, I feel like, were helpful. Like, we had this one part where you had to set your goals for the day. So you would set how much schoolwork you were getting done. And you had to, like, finish a certain amount by the end of the year, right? Mm -hmm. But you could sit there and say, like, okay, this is this is pretty easy. I can do five pages in science. And then I can do two pages in math because it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. And as long as you stayed on this time frame, you could set your own goals and then once you were done with your goals, you were done. So he didn't have homework. He didn't have any of that stuff. So in that regard, I really feel like it helped me learn how to set goals and reach them. Okay. So I do like that aspect of it. I feel that like that sounds like me. a very cool concept. I yeah, mean, it, it it teaches people how to delegate appropriately. Yeah, and so and if you didn't, you got behind, and then the teacher comes and says, "Okay, you're behind." So now you spend an all weekend <laughs> yeah, <you're> doing, <laughs> doing your own work. work. But it also that hurt me a little bit in college because I'm like, "Excuse me, homework? No, <laughs> I don't do homework. Right? I gotta have this done tomorrow. <laughs> what, what do you what? mean? <laughs> no, you do it all in school. Um, so you know there were there were good things and, and some bad things about it. Um. I definitely, being the type of learner that I am, I learn better in a group. Like, I love bouncing ideas off people. I like, you know, having that interaction, and that helps me remember better than just reading. So, yeah, I'm a, I've always been an auditory learner, hence all the audio. Equipment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I always, I still get crap from people. They're like, audiobooks? <laughs> get away from me, peasant. I'm just like, I can't I can't read a book to save my life. I'd take me like four weeks to read like a children's yeah. book. But if I had like an audio book, I can finish it in like two hours. I'm like, cat no, in the sense. hat, uh no. <laughs> exactly. So I have the exact opposite experience though. In Catholic school, they're like, that's wrong. Get out of here. <laughs> you know, it, I think it helped me. Um, I mean, still to this day, I find myself doing a lot of things that I did. Um uh, going back to the story that I said when I first went to a private school. I mean, I'm sorry, a public school, They, I came back the next day and they didn't do their homework. And I was like, you don't have your home? Ooh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, literally the teacher didn't say a word. And I said, whoa, yeah, I'm going to try that one day and see what happened. And then, I mean, and that's where some bad habits started to form because um, I, I, private schools, I mean, I know everyone cannot afford it. And that's mm -hmm. why I am a, a, a true believer of the Ed Choice and, you know, different charter schools that can offer smaller classes. Because I went from having a classroom of 10 to 12 people to a classroom of 20, 25 people. And now I'm switching classes, too. So the teachers don't, you don't really stand out unless you stand out. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't that smart. I mean, people said I was smart, but it didn't feel like it because my grades didn't reflect that. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, so everybody's smart getting Ds and Fs, huh? <laughs> but um, I do think the private school did uh, put a lot of structure in me, um, especially from the religious standpoint. Um, I think religion and schools, it, it, I mean, I know it's a touchy topic, and there's at least three main things that we don't discuss most of the times, and that's religion, politics, and f um, uh, 
whatever people want to fight about. Like, <laughs> like if, if you in the moment, if, like yeah, you, like <laughs> the hot mo- topic. <laughs> yeah, but it's. I think that also helped. I think, um, and again, our spiritual backgrounds with mm-hmm. our parents. You know, we if when you're taught so much to be so giving and so loving and all that, it's like you have no choice but to do it at some point. Right. So. Yeah. That's my take. Yeah. <laughs> Enough about school, though. That's yeah. boring. Nobody wants to talk about school. So, what's the kids stay in school? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, what's some advice you have for people? I mean, not not everybody gets to make it up to be a CEO position, and that's kind of like when you're when you're an, a worker of anything, you just think CEO or president or whatever is like, like the highest place you can get. What's what's some advice you have for people that say maybe aspire to be at this level of you know? I mean, it's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of work. Uh, what would you say? Because you've had a like a sounds like a very different background from from other people, which is always good. I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord, don't do it. No. Uh, <laughs> it really, but it is really, I think it just all depends on uh, on the person, right? So I guess the biggest advice, like well, for me, how I always knew that I I wanted something more, right? So, so this is good. Being a B- DSP was good, and I liked it, and I loved the interaction and being one-on-one with people, and... Um, that that was always very fulfilling, but like I knew I always wanted wanted more, um, and so I really just kept looking for opportunities and not saying. But I guess for for me, and I'm trying to like put this correctly because I don't want anyone to think like I was never just like ignoring the people or not supporting them correctly <laughs> <Got> <laughs> and you. just looking for my way out. You know, like that wasn't mm. ever what it was. Um, But just really looking for those opportunities. And I did, and you have to put yourself out there. So the place that I worked before, uh, for, before getting the job as a CEO at at Riverview, um, I applied for promotion and you'll probably get this because you kind of know the political landscape of (laughs) everything. (laughs) Um, I uh, applied for a promotion, um, about 10 times in three years Mm. and got denied every Mm. time. And at the end, I'm like, I'm just putting my name in because... Because I just can't stop now, like yeah. you know, like this is gonna happen. Either this is gonna happen, or it's gonna happen somewhere else. And I remember sitting down and said, "Look, I gave myself a two-year time frame to be promoted here," <laughs> which I know maybe sounds like arrogant, but that's what I did. No, I set a goal, all. right? Not at all. Good job. And I set that goal, and I said, after two years, and I said, if it doesn't happen in two years, I will be looking other place, other places. And you know, I had talked about it with my spouse and said, like, this is the plan going in. You know, does this sound good to you? And he's like, yeah, that's a good time frame. You can prove yourself. You can work hard. You can show it. Um, and I remember um, sitting with like one of the top bosses, and I said, well, it's been two years, so just so you know, I will be looking and I will take an opportunity when it presents itself. (laughs) So, and you know, and so they knew, like, you know, they knew. And so if Mm -hmm. you're willing to, to let me go, then, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to go at some point. Um, so I really always just like set my goals and even in timeframes, right. So I recognize as a college graduate, maybe I'm not going to get like the best, most amazing job, but where do I go and where do I put in the work and always being the, like, I, I, and I know it just sounds so cocky and I'm like, if you know me in real life, I'm really not a cocky <laughs> person, <laughs> but like, I just, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to be really, really good at it. And you know, I'm going to mm-hmm. do my best and I'm going to show, like, I want to show people, I want to prove myself. Like, I don't think I deserve any promotion just because I say I do. I'm going to show you show and I'm going to prove that I deserve that and put the work in. I feel like that's how I've always been. Only idiotic people confuse the 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 motivation of what you are trying to do as being cocky or arrogant. Mm-hmm. So no, not at all. Especially on this podcast, <laughs> in, in our presence, that is. I mean, because I I'll tell anybody and everybody, I am awesome. Mm-hmm. You know why I'm awesome? Because I'm going to show you I'm awesome. I'm going to do everything that I can. Same thing with Paul. He's going to do everything that he can to be the best that he can. So you did everything the right way. Mm-hmm. You know, I I. I don't like it when people want to do things for a short amount of time, like five, six months, eight or nine months and act like, oh, well, you should give me the world now. Right. Because I I put in my work. I put in my time. Like it takes a a baby longer to bake than what you just did. (laughs) Trust me, I know. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So it's um, 
Yeah, I, I take my hat off to you. I'm glad that you did that. And I think more people need to do it. Well, and I think just really being honest with your goals. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some of them, oh, I'm just going to bide my time. No, I'm going to tell you straight up. This, this, is, this is what I'm here for, and this is what I'm going to do. And then... You know, we're going to move forward from there. Yeah. I'm just not I'm not really good at, at staying in one place too long. And I think that's what I really like um, about. I mean, and you can attest like about this field is like nothing's ever the same. same. Yes. <laughs> ever. It is different. Sometimes I'm like, I could take some boredom. Yeah. <laughs> Please. I would like to be bored right that's now. That's what a vacation is for. But then when you're CEO, you don't even get a vacation. I, you know, <laughs> I didn't even. So I just had a baby and I took like. A week and a half off and then I was just like okay we're back to it we gotta go we gotta go you know it's, fun it's funny that you say that the last baby that we had and this is five years ago that shows how much time has passed I was on a Blackberry covering shifts while my wife was literally pushing. You know, now this was our fifth child. So, you know, we've been through this stuff. By that, and, you're just like, just are yeah, you done yet? I mean, I, honestly, I thought she was going to ask for a pizza while she was doing it. <laughs> like, is my order here? No. But, yeah, it, that's the kind of dedication it takes. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that. When If you want to be the best of the best, or at least in your head the best of the best, which will eventually get you there, mm -hmm. you have to make those sacrifices that nobody else is willing to. I grew up with too many people saying, man, Tony, if I was you, I wouldn't be doing that, man, I'm sure. And yet now, and not just from a financial standpoint, but I am literally richer in every single way than every person who's ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. I'm more richer spiritually. I'm more richer um, family life. I'm more richer in my goals. And I mean, yeah, I make good profits. Too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I deserve those profits. I bust my tail for so many years, over almost 20 years, with no extra anything other than overtime. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, yeah. T Patrick, do this right here. Pat it. Pat yourself petting. on the back. <laughs> well, and I, think, I just think it's just so important. And so what we've been really trying to do is, because, you know, gosh, it's been a year, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's been a year. But we've really just been trying to, like, recognize right away, you know, when someone does something amazing, like, don't wait and nominate them for Employee of the Month, like, yeah. a month later. Tell them you right know, like, tell them right there. Like, that mm -hmm. was amazing. Thank you. And if you can afford it, give them... A gift certificate or something. Yeah, do, you know? do something. Yes. Do something nice. Like, I mean, not everything's about money, but man, I remember being, I was just talking about this the other day. Like, I remember being so dirt poor as a DSP. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I remember this one winter, it's in Minnesota, so you know it's cold. And yeah. um, I had $10 left, and I put $5 of gas in my car, and I was a smoker at the time, and mm -hmm. I got a super nasty gas station coffee. I'm a little bit of a coffee stump. <laughs> and a pack of like $2.50 cigarettes. <laughs> and I remember... Are they basics? Just to get... I don't even know what... Oh, they were bad. USA Golds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> probably saw, they were so bad. I just remember sitting in my car freezing because it's Minnesota in winter. <laughs> Like drinking this terrible coffee, smoking this terrible cigarette, and thinking, why am I doing, doing this, this right now? <laughs> so, like, I can definitely empathize with with the the plight. Yeah. So, so hey, tell us what new do you have planned for the company? I mean, you guys seem to do be almost rock stars. I mean, I saw you on the news and I was like, oh man, look at Sarah. <laughs> She's on the news and stuff. I can't even get the news to call me back. <laughs> and I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to stop calling me back once they yeah, find probably. out I was yeah, on here? Like, oh, oh man. See, we make went, up our own news. We don't yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> we make up fake news. Yeah. <laughs> fake news. Oh, um, what? <laughs> This is your new slogan right there. That, yeah, right. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Friends for life. Get your fake news here. Uh, <laughs> every other Saturday yeah. at 10 a.m. <laughs> um, so we do, we have like some really exciting stuff going on. We are, so we do a little bit of everything. We do like uh, supported living for people in their homes. And then we do um, day services, which can be employment. It can be. Um, coming to a facility, kind of learning employment skills or just mm. doing like therapeutic recreation. Um, 
But what I'm most excited about is something that we call our focus groups. And they're small groups of um, the max people in it are four and one staff, so five. Okay. And just getting in the community and really digging down and seeing what people's interests are. Um, so I like, I like to – I use this too much, but I always say, like, you know, I'm not here to warehouse dis- disabled bodies. You know, like, so, so many people I feel like are in the system and they're like – well, we need to get, but right now, you know, if you're in day services, you've taken a hit, right? Because COVID's happened, small groups, people are afraid to come back. When you do come back, you have about 5,000 regulations you have to follow. And I'm not saying they're not necessary. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, um, I just, I want people to have, you know, and people are like, well, you know, their parents have to get to work or, you know, uh, the HPC staff, the supported living staff can't, you know, support them 24 seven. They need a break. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how we approach (laughs) this. Yeah. Like we need to get people back because they need meaningful events in their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what you meant to say. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That's what you were going for. That's that's (laughs) what I'm hearing. Okay. Um, so we're doing these small groups. They're out in the community. Um, they're, we're volunteering. We're we have one group uh, at the, they're, like they're all fitness fanatics. Ooh. You see, you might hang out with them sometime. There you go. Right? Well, okay, that's what I like. <laughs> they're all fitness, and so like they'll go on bike rides. They're you know with winter coming, they're like, okay, we need to get some gym memberships. We need to work out. <laughs> we need some place to walk. And I'm just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll find all those things, I'll I guess. Just, I'll be over here eating a Twinkie. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I support you. Yeah. Um, I love it. But yeah, so like we're just doing a lot of fun, like a lot of really great stuff. But the, but the whole purpose is to like, you know, ha- have people try new things because people with disabilities, you know, they don't, they get underestimated all the time or, or mm-hmm. people think that they don't have interests or, you know, oh, if you're a disabled person, like you want a job cleaning. No, no. no. Like <laughs> yeah. people with disabilities are human. OK, mm-hmm. they have many interests. So like really taking the time to find out interest um, and dig into that and explore new things. We're hoping to art, uh, open one that's like focused on art and talk about like the therapeutic ways that art can be helpful to you whether that's That's music or sculpture or painting or you know it's not just making greeting cards and selling them sorry you know like people with disabilities like there is like oh you can draw let's make greeting cards cards, now and then like like what happened like the early 2000s like every day program opened an art studio (laughs) we had one you know (laughs) <laughs> and it's just like, look at these artists. And they're like, well, oh, it's fine. I actually sat in a meeting one time and I was really infuriated, which happens from time to time because obviously I have strong opinions. <laughs> but someone was trying to tell um, this person on my caseload, she's like, um, you need to stay in this this art program here at this day program. Wow. And I was like, why? She's like, because she needs something to do during the day. And I'm like, what? what? And she's like, but she loves art. She has to stay. And I looked and I said, what do you like about art? And she's like, well, I really like how it helps me manage my anxiety and this and that. I said, okay. So why are we trying to send her here when, I don't know if you've met anyone in Toledo, but there's a million great artists in Toledo. We have an amazing art museum. We have just tons of opportunity. Handmade Toledo, mm-hmm. that's kind of artsy and stuff like that. They do classes there all the time. I said, why are we busting our butts to keep her here, here in yeah. this segregated location when she could be in the community. Mm-hmm. And they're like, but she could get depressed. How is that an argument? So yeah. I just get so <laughs> mad. Like people really do a lot of stuff to keep disabled people segregated. And it really annoys mm. me. It, it's so funny. Um, I was kind of, we, we were kind of, you know, we mentioned something about budgeting mm-hmm. earlier and yes. stuff. And one of the, yes, yeah, the worst part of mm-hmm. the biz. Um, we were talking somewhere. I can't. I can't even remember who I was speaking with about it. But it was about individuals, and you know, we're trying to in Ohio trying to get people out of ICFs mm-hmm. and more residential. Mm-hmm. But it's turning out to be um, a terrible financial situation for it because the DSPs aren't able to get paid enough, and the only way that we can pay them enough is meeting like MRC ratios or. Um, you know, basically stacking more people together. Mm-hmm. So now you're getting roommates. And the roommates, it's not like 
normal roommates. Like you and I will have to get to know each other for a while or you and I have to get to know each other a while, Paul, before we decide like, hey, let's room. But our uh, quote unquote, and that's the hour quote unquote, our thing of that is like two or three visits and you see if everybody laughs and jokes together and then all of a sudden, okay, yeah, you can move on in. I mean, based off the standard <laughs> for giving people roommates, like we would be looking for a house right now. Like yeah. based on this yeah. hour, let's go shopping. Shop. Let's go for mm-hmm. a house. It's fine. And you know, I might not flush the toilet after I take a poop, but guess what? Now we're roomies, guys. <laughs> Neither does my five-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably not quite as offensive from her though. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a lot of issues with that, I feel, because I think it's slowly going to lead back to the original way of thinking with it, that ICFs are going to be a big thing again, especially through all the COVID stuff. Mm-hmm. There, People are going to realize, wow, it's probably easier to keep uh, these kind of individuals in a place like this where you can segregate and all of it. So, I don't know. I I'm not... Huge conspiracy theorist, but that's where I see it going. Let me tell you, though, like what I've seen, because I had the same fears. So I am very much community. Like Mm -hmm. I value community. Um, I've done some training and it's called social role valorization. It's a mouthful to say, but it's all about how sometimes inclusion and integration isn't organic and sometimes it is and that's awesome but sometimes it takes a lot of legwork and a lot of hours put in and it takes work and very purposeful work um and so i'm i'm just really all about community and that was my biggest fear when all this started was like is this just another way that we're just segregating because don't get me wrong if you have like underlying health conditions, you know, if you're you're vulnerable, absolutely protect yourself mm-hmm. and do that. But also not everyone with a disability is vulnerable. And people right. don't understand that. Like I know so many people with disabilities who are healthy, who, you know, could very easily. So like to me to just group everyone together like that yeah. and not realize the individuality of each person. It's, it's frustrating. And that was my big fear is like, this is going to be a way that we're just going to, and we're going to do it for what, quote, health and safety, safety. which is what we have done <laughs> yeah. for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do all this in the name of health and safety. And I'm not even saying like the choices were wrong or anything, but this is just automatically where my head goes. Like when you know the history of disabled people, you know mm-hmm. that we used to ship them off and ignore them and, you know, terrible things happen because of that. And so just this underlying fear. But I will say, for the people that we support and help that live in a community setting, like we only have, I think the most people we have living together is maybe two or three. And if that house gets COVID, it's a lot less dangerous than if they take it back to a huge group setting right. like that. So to me, that's actually like a little bit of a less, a lesser risk and a benefit of that. So we haven't had, they're not on some, I don't want to mess up your sound. Go ahead. No, do it. Do okay. It. There you go. <laughs> I'll edit it and post it. Sound like a big tree now. Yeah, oh, really. amazing. Make it sound like a crash. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, I mean. But you know, I feel like yeah. it's it's allowed a, a, a higher level of safety, and for people like our our staff has been amazing, and they've just been like getting you know still going to work, doing everything they need to do, and that's been really really awesome to see the level of dedication and care that people have for other people. So what do you think it would take to normalize disabilities as a whole? I mean, for the average person who doesn't work in the field, doesn't know anybody, doesn't have any family members with disabilities, like you said, it's just like they see somebody out somewhere occasionally with a disability and they're just like, yeah, whatever. Well, let me tell you, because this happens to be one of my favorite things to talk about. No, um, school inclusion and it's got to start young. So there are actual studies out there that show that, Kids who go to school with dis- other with diverse children, whether mm-hmm. you know it's disability, um, different ethnicity, yeah, and, mm-hmm. that they're actually it creates a more compassionate and empathetic culture and population. So my whole thing is I fight tooth and nail. So my daughter um, has multiple disabilities because she's an overachiever, and I have to fight all the time for her to be around her typical peers 
And that to me is like, not only are you robbing her of an experience of a school experience, but you're also robbing those other children of being able to know people different and being com more compassionate, you know, and all that. So for me, it's got to start young, you know, get yeah. kids. And I don't care if they are what's called total care or if they can speak or, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. the, the cute little, what we call high functioning. And I even hate that label. So yeah, I don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a, a replacement yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, but like, you know, the cute little high functioning kid, oh, they can be in class. But you know, if there's this kid that sometimes makes some noise or spins around a little, mm -hmm. or, you know, occasionally will hit himself in the head, you know, like we don't want that. We want the cute disability. We don't want the ugly disability. Right. Yeah. So like we, we put standards on people based on that and whether, and, and we judge whether people can be included or not. And so, um, my daughter doesn't speak. Um, and depending on her seizure activity or how she's feeling, she might not even be very expressive, but if you take the time to get to know her, you can tell pretty much by her eyes what she is thinking. thinking yeah. And she's sarcastic and she's funny. And if you're too nice, she will totally sit there and mess. We had a nurse come in and she's like, oh, hi. And just sweet as can be. And this girl was like, mm, yeah, I'm about I'm, to let you get it. I'm about to mess with you. good." <laughs> and I had to come in and she was sitting there. This She had this nurse sitting there staring at her. And I'm like, what What are you doing? And she's like, well, this just happened, and it was odd. And I literally looked. I'm like, Evangeline, I swear to God, you stop that now. You cut that shit out right now. Mama is not tolerating that. And I said, don't let her work you like that, please. Oh, but, you know, man. but, like, so, like, people have personalities, and there's things that you can you can learn about them if you just take the time. And But, again, mm -hmm. that's something that you have to teach, and you have to learn, and you have to learn early because pretty soon – it's all about, oh, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go, you know, yeah. right? Money's time. Time is money. We got to go. We got to mm -hmm. do this. And we're so consumed with that, which isn't bad. Like, that's me. And that's part of the reason <laughs> I'm where I am, right? Um, but to take the time to recognize it's okay to take five or ten minutes and really get to, like, you know, instead of just saying, like, I hate, like, how you doing? Fine. Or, you know, what happens mm -hmm. if you're like, how are you today? Well, let me tell you it's what really bad. happened. It's been a bad day. <laughs> It's been mm -hmm. all right. Like, well, you said, how was your day? I'm like, it was good. I'm like, yeah, but I had to work on my budget. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> you know? Didn't like doing that. I didn't like it at all. Um, you, so, you know. A lot of what you say even expresses um, in the political climate that we're in. There's so much going on from people who just don't know about other people. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are so many separate sides, and you can't know what's going on unless you go and you integrate yourself in some form or fashion. Like, I don't understand how, I mean, just to use anything as an example, we'll use race relations. I mean, that's pretty political right now. Yeah, that's, I'd say so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it? I hadn't really seen it in the news no. much. I've <laughs> never know. even heard of it. It's yeah. so weird. <laughs> you guys been under a rock. <laughs> but, you know, if I never seen a person of of, of, of a different ethnicity, how would I know how to react? I think one of the first things most people do just, I mean, just to go back to disability, what have we seen time and time again? You see somebody with a disability, maybe in a wheelchair, they probably, let's say they can't even speak. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? And I've had clients type on their pad, I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't yeah. yell. Please. And it's just like, oh, you know, you 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 sub, you you. Um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Come on, help me out, people. I'm on you national. Know, um, you, <laughs> people, you're on your own. You substituted. Yeah, okay. there we go. <laughs> you substituted Sublime. one disability for another. Right. And just grouping it all together, basically. And I think that that's wrong because of the fact that people have not been put in those situations enough. Mm -hmm. But that's well, our... Well, and just the, the, like, you know, the, the, the idea that people with disabilities need pitied, right? Like, mm. hey, buddy, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like... I actually think I just turned into the girl from Schitt's Creek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> but I, 
I swear, I have it DVR'd, haven't got to watch it yet. Is it, is it good? Oh, I, I'm i pretty obsessed with it right now. I haven't made it that far because <laughs> I have, you said you have five kids. I also have five kids. Mm. My oldest is seven. So I have five kids, seven and under. Oh, yes. And you are busy. by the time I actually sit down, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just out. <laughs> Damn, sir, why didn't I know that? I didn't know you had five. Well, I yes, I do. Oh, well, congrats! I do. Nice. Yes, the fifth. Yeah, but so my fifth was actually fun story. We should just share with the world. Please. Do it. My my fifth was actually um, I got pregnant with him six months post vasectomy. Oh, whoa! Yes. Um. So I need the name of the doctor after we get off, so I don't <laughs> no, go there. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I called my husband. I'm like, you know. I wouldn't cheat on you, right? Because <laughs> I'm pregnant. <laughs> and he's like, obviously, I know that. I said, okay, yes. Um, and so, so then we just chose to like have a C-section. I like got my tubes removed. They're like, do you want us to cut them? I'm like, no. Nope. no. Do you want them to tie? Nope. Do you want to burn? No. I need them out just of my on. body. <laughs> Get it out of here. I'm too fertile. I, t- I told the doctor, I'm like, I need you to remove every reprodu- reproductive organ, please. <laughs> and he's like, I can't remove your ovaries because you'd have no friends. I said, if I I have one more child. I will have, have no, no friends. friends. <laughs> so really, either way, it's bad. So. Oh, awesome! To awesome time, Sarah. I, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, so thank much. you. Um, you know, we typically try to only do them an hour because we don't want anybody getting overly, you know, have too much fun, and then you leave and. Then you want to come back all the time. Life is just not the same. All yeah. of a sudden, I'm camped outside the door. door. Like, it's I happened. Think, yeah. It's happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. But hey, before we go, uh, give the listeners uh, all your plugs. You know, your company, any social media tags, all of that. If you don't know it, then you need to do better. I do. Well, first off, I do need to do better, and okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. Um, but yeah, so you can look uh, our company up on RVI. Um, we are Riverview Industries, but we go by RVI because we're cool like that. And yeah, who course. wouldn't want to confuse the general public? Yeah. Um, uh, but RVI, we are on Facebook. You can like us and see kind of some of the fun things we've been doing lately. Nice. Um, for myself, I do have a Facebook page. Just look up Sarah Milliman. Um, I do public speaking. Should you ever need it, I can do motivational. I do a lot of um, mentoring and speaking for parents. And Very much I needed. also. Yes, that's a whole that's a whole other podcast. Yes, you, you're um, coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you that later if you didn't invite me back. Like, Tony, you haven't invited me yet. Um, but yeah, hit me up. We do. I do a lot of education. Um, I've done um, some education for religious organizations about how religion um, can be more disability and friendly and inclusive, and religion can be more accessible because accessibility is more than just stairs or elevators. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so you can find me on Facebook. Facebook and uh, you can find the company on Facebook and yeah I I, I don't have I need to get no. better at my other stuff I do know that it's okay we'll work on it I, right. I, I was terrible myself you say I, I hired a guy to do it <laughs> I was gonna say was <laughs> yeah I'm was. still bad I like hey where's the what's this likey button what, what does that <laughs> what do is, that? is the heart good <laughs> linked book yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my, my my LinkedIn social media pages I cannot figure LinkedIn I I I know, because you contact you contacted me on that originally, and I'm mm. like, well, how, what is this? What is this red <laughs> dot? What is, what is on this most app? Awkward, yeah. It's the most awkward platform. Is it recording me? <laughs> it's, it's so <laughs> peculiar. But uh, hey, so, again, thank yeah, you, Sarah, thank for you. coming on. Thank you, our listeners. Paul, you want to take us out? Yeah, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. We'll see you all next time. And uh, thank you, Sarah. It was a blast. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of the Friends for Life podcast here on YouTube. If you can, go down below and hit that subscribe button. Help us out with growing our channel. I want to thank Sarah Milliman for coming on tonight. If you'd like to learn more about what she does at Riverview, you can go to rviinc.org. Or if you'd like to learn more about what Sarah does in her own personal time with uh, motivational speaking, working with parents of children with disabilities, you can go follow her Facebook page, as we mentioned earlier, and you can learn more about her that way. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.